So let me tell you about those four cases, and we're going to ultimately put this in perspective in thinking about some of these issues between protection and empowerment, autonomy, and uh, uh, control. In 2005, the United States Supreme Court decided a case called Roper versus Simmons. Roper was a case in which the court was asked to re-examine whether or not children could be executed in the United States. Now, hopefully, there, there's a, a revulsion even in thinking about that. The United States, at the time that Roper came before the court, was the only country in the world that actually executed children, at least as a matter of formal statutory law. Uh, and not, uh, you know, I think unknown to many folks, while the Supreme Court was considering this question in 2005, it had already decided in 1989 that actually it was okay to execute kids who had committed homicides who were 16 or 17 years old. It had said it wasn't okay for children who were under the age of 16, but okay for 16 and 17 year olds. So the issue before the Supreme Court in 2005 was really this question about whether or not we would continue to be the only country in the world that allowed for the execution of 16 and 17 year olds. The Supreme Court said no. It reversed its 1989 decision. And in Roper, the court for the first time looked at empirical research. It didn't look at what was intuitive. It didn't make assumptions about kids, but it looked at research that was presented to it by professionals in the field, and it recognized three critical things about kids. It said, number one, of course, that kids have an immaturity of thinking. You all know that because you all work with kids. It said that kids are extraordinarily unnaturally susceptible to negative peer pressure. You all know that as well. And thirdly, it said that kids have a really unique capacity for change and for rehabilitation. And the reason for that, as the research really demonstrated to the court, is this idea that adolescence is a time of transition. It's a time of change. The neurologists talk about plasticity, that lots of what is happening in adolescence is actually not fixed but will ultimately give way to the adults that these sometimes seemingly unthinking adolescents will become. Roper was followed five years later by a case called uh, Graham versus Florida. In Graham, the court was presented with another very severe sentencing issue uh, involving juveniles. Roper asked the court whether or not it would continue to allow for a sentence of life without parole for juveniles who were convicted of non-homicide crimes. The individual whose case was before the U.S. Supreme Court was actually a, a, a very sympathetic young man that framed the question perfectly. A 16-year-old who had been found guilty of a home invasion robbery had been placed on probation violated his probation for another home invasion robbery, robbery, wasn't charged with a home invasion robbery, was charged with a probation violation, and received a sentence of life without parole for the probation violation from the sentencing judge in Florida. The case goes before the U.S. Supreme Court, and in 2010, the court says this, too, violates the Eighth Amendment. This, too, violates what we think is an acceptable way to treat juveniles who commit criminal acts. The court in Graham relied on the exact same research that it had available to it in the, in the Roper case. It had a little bit more information available to it in Graham, which was that for the first time in 2010, the court also looked at the brain research. So I know that everybody in this room, as I already mentioned, we all know about the brain. But, but the court in the initial death penalty case didn't really focus on that research. In 2010, in the Graham case, the court said, you know what, the brain research, the neuroscience that we're now being presented with really confirms what the developmental scientists and what the behavioral scientists have been telling us. And so the court struck juvenile life without parole for juveniles, and it said a couple of important things in Graham. Number one, it reiterated that when you think about the three attributes of adolescence that the court identified in Roper, the key thing that those attributes demonstrate is that juveniles are less blameworthy than adults for their criminal conduct. They're less culpable. And if they're less culpable, it means that we can't punish them in the same way that we do adults. And we certainly can't punish them with the harshest penalties that we provide for adults in the adult criminal justice system.
The court also said that life without parole is an unconstitutional sentence because it denies hope. It denies hope to juveniles who are subjected to that sentence who know they will never get out of prison. And it denies juveniles the opportunity as they grow up to demonstrate that growth and maturity and that capacity for rehabilitation. The hallmarks of really what it means to transition from adolescence to adulthood. And the court recognized that if we take juveniles, if we take adolescents as we find them, which is this transient period with great opportunity for growth, but great capacity for mischief during their adolescent years, uh, then we can impose this hopeless sentence that denies that very fundamental, uh, important element, which is that capacity to demonstrate growth and maturity. One year later, in 2011, the Supreme Court decided another case called JDB versus North Carolina. JDB was not a sentencing case. JDB was actually a case about how we apply the adult custody standard for juveniles in terms of figuring out when we would Mirandize them. So everybody knows the Miranda warnings because everybody watches Law & Order. You can't <laughs> escape it. Um, but while Miranda actually was a case that was decided by the Supreme Court in the early 1960s, we have never, as a country, and the court has never, examined what does it mean to be a 13-year-old, a 14-year-old, a 12-year-old, sit in a room with uniformed police officers, be interrogated, and think about whether or not that youth actually thinks they can walk out of the interrogation room. Might a youth perceive their inability, their lack of power and autonomy, to terminate that interrogation differently than an adult? And so, more than 50 years after the Miranda case was decided in 2011, in JDB versus North Carolina, the Supreme Court said, youth matters. And it relied on the same body of research that it had relied on in the Roper decision and in the Graham decision, and said, youth matters, we need a reasonable juvenile test, not a reasonable person test. Law enforcement has to think about what would a juvenile think, how would a juvenile perceive the circumstances of this interrogation that I am subjecting them to, if they would, ex would experience it as custodial, as coercive, then I need to give them Miranda warnings. We can have a whole separate debate about how well children understand Miranda warnings, and that case will come for sure, but the point is that in JDB versus North Carolina, we had for the first time the court saying in a non-sentencing <laughs> case, really in a due process case, youth matters. And we're going to impose a different standard on the police when we subject children to law enforcement interrogation. The last case in this quartet of cases that the Supreme Court decided was Miller versus Alabama, which was decided by the court in 2012. Miller was another sentencing case. And in Miller, the Supreme Court was again confronted with the question about life without parole sentences, but this time in homicide cases, a much harder case what to do when children who are under the age of 18 commit homicide, can we impose a life without parole sentence upon them? The Supreme Court in Miller didn't go quite as far as I think certainly many of us in the advocacy community had hoped they would, but the court did strike mandatory life without parole sentences for juveniles convicted of homicide. What it said, again relying on all of this research that has been before the court in these cases, was that because juveniles have distinct attributes that are associated with youth and adolescence, we have to take those attributes into account when we sentence juveniles, even for the most serious crimes, even when considering the most serious punishments. A mandatory sentence strips the court of the ability to take those attributes of youth into account. But the court went even a little bit further in Miller, and what it said was that we also want this sentence to be rare and uncommon. Rare and uncommon. So the court, while allowing for the possibility that a sentence of life without parole might be imposed for juveniles who commit homicide, was also sending a very clear message that it should almost never happen. What's the message of these four cases? The message of these four cases is protection. The message of these four cases is if we think about youth and take them as they are, meet them where they are,
We recognize now empirically what we know about adolescents. We recognize that there are aspects of growing up in America that requires a protective stance. We can contrast that with an earlier series of U.S. Supreme Court cases in the 1960s where the Supreme Court was confronting a different dilemma and a different set of questions. When the court was being asked to examine what had been at that point a very secretive juvenile justice system that was not transparent, not held accountable, juveniles, kids who were involved in the system had no right to counsel, had no opportunity to cross-examine or question witnesses, to even confront witnesses, could be sent away for six years for making a phony phone call, which is exactly what happened to a young man named Gerald Galt in Arizona in 1963. His case gets to the U.S. Supreme Court in 1967, and his case is the first in another series of three or four cases in which the court ushers in a due process revolution. That due process revolution was all about rights and autonomy and empowering kids to have a voice, to have their voice heard, and to participate in delinquency proceedings in which they were involved. Let's think about that. If we think about where we are today, and I think this is where your um, comments about the, the trends that we are seeing now, what the federal government has done, and where the federal gov government has moved in the last four or five years with respect to dealing with youth in care, in and out of care, in and out of the system. Let's just think about youth transitioning out of adulthood and the extension of care to foster youth over the age of 18 in many jurisdictions up through age 21. That's protective, right? That's a recognition that foster youth coming out of the system at age 18, and I have 22 and 27 year old daughters, so for me it was an easy sort of understanding that there's no way my daughters at 18 were able to take care of themselves. Um, and But we all knew that, and yet we had this fiction that we could push foster youth out of the system at 18 and they would suddenly magically become mature adults. They're not. They need help, they need our protection. And so we have extended care in many jurisdictions, and I'm sure we will continue to do that for youth aging out of care over the age of 18. But not to delinquent youth. For delinquent youth, we don't extend the jurisdiction of the juvenile court. We don't say that youth who commit crimes at 18, although they're in that same developmental stage and certainly neurologically that same undeveloped stage as their foster youth peers, we don't say that we're going to think about them differently. Instead, we presume an autonomy, an autonomous decision making on their part to engage in criminal conduct. In New York, and I'm sure there are folks here from New York, um, you can't, in New York, if you are 16 and 17, you're an adult. For what any, any crime that you commit, you are considered to be an adult in the state of New York. We're hopeful that that's going to change within the next year or so, but that has historically been the way that youth have been treated in the New York system with respect to their involvement in the justice system. Treating kids as adults, prosecuting any child as an adult. We treat a 14-year-old as much too young to participate in all kinds of civic activities in society, 15, 16, 17-year-olds, and yet we also are willing to say, if you commit a certain kind of crime, if it's particularly serious, if you use a weapon, suddenly we impose autonomy on you the ability to make an intentional decision about engaging in that particular contact, contact and conduct. Let's think about sexual conduct between very young children. If you think about how many states penalize and will punish and will charge delinquency in cases of two individuals under the age of 14, under the age of 13, both of them, engaging in some type of sexual contact from the very minimal to perhaps more severe or more serious, oftentimes what happens is that the prosecutor makes a decision. They charge one. One is the victim and one is the perpetrator because that's the way the system is designed to operate. And yet both of those children under the age of 14 or 13 or 12 are in the protected class that we also, as a society, as a state, have made a determination requires our protection. So when, when we think about this work going forward, the message and the set of questions that I would leave you with 
is that we are in a very dynamic time. We have a series of Supreme Court decisions that have established a new floor of protection. We don't know where that ceiling is, but we have a new floor of protection that recognizes that the distinctive attributes of adolescents and youth that make them less blameworthy for their criminal conduct require a different response and a different set of, inter of interventions. We also have another set of policies unfolding on the child welfare side that are also recognizing that older youth require greater protections. At the same time, all of us in this room, whatever job we hold, we're all advocates for youth. And we all know through our work that the voices of youth must be heard, that youth must have the ability to participate in the critical decisions that affect their lives and to shape their lives and to reflect on the kinds of decisions that we make about them. So the question that I pose to you and that I leave you with is really under what circumstances, when and where is it appropriate to impose autonomy on youth? And that's what we do when we impose criminal responsibility. Under what circumstances is it appropriate to deny autonomy to youth? Under what circumstances is it ap appropriate to provide protection to youth, as we are increasingly doing for kids at the most severe end of the criminal justice spectrum, as we are doing for older youth in foster care? But under what circumstances do we allow ourselves to deny protection? And that comes out not just in how we think about even the continued prosecution of youth in the adult system, harsh circumstances that children find themselves in, in the justice system, the use of solitary confinement, isolation, restraints, other kinds of harsh practices. This is all this tension between protection on the one hand, autonomy, empowerment, and control. Questions that we have struggled with in different ways, I think, throughout history, but I would argue are questions that we really have a moment now where we need to confront them very directly, and I think we have an opportunity to come up with some different answers. Thank you.